My father uh, it was, uh, he was a Boston school teacher and just a really good guy and I learned a lot, tried to model myself after him. I had a cousin, an older cousin who was a Marine in uh, World War II and although I didn't know him all, all that well, I saw enough of him to uh, really kind of admire him and want to follow in his footsteps too. I went on to college at the College of the Holy Cross up in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, it wasn't until just before I uh, got ready to graduate in the spring of 1960 that I uh, even uh, became interested in, in joining the service. And uh, I, I joined kind of by accident uh, about a month before graduation. A couple of my best pals uh, disappeared one afternoon. And when they came back, I said, where you been? And they said, well, we were downtown. We, we signed up for the Navy. Uh, Navy Officer Candidate School, and I said, my goodness, you know, what did you do that for? And they said, well, it's a great deal, you know, and you can see the world and all that business. And next day I went down and I did the same thing. So that's, that's how I got in the Navy, not through any, uh, you know, glamorous, uh, romantic uh, visions of serving my country, but just because uh, my two pals did. Thomas Kelly enlisted in the Navy in 1960. He was trained as an officer and would eventually make the Navy a career. In 1966, he was serving off the shores of Vietnam, well away from the actual combat. However, in 1968, with the war heating up, he volunteered for more dangerous duty with the Navy's River Assault Division. On June 15, 1969, Lieutenant Kelly led a group of eight boats into a particularly difficult river pass near Kien Hoa, Vietnam. Well, it was a Sunday, and it was, uh, it was hot like it always was over there. And uh, we started off early in the morning, and we were making several insertions of, of Army troops and picking them up and uh, taking them to a different spot and dropping them off and picking them up again. This went on till mid-afternoon, I would say. And uh, during the... Uh, early part of the day or through midday, we had pretty good support from Navy and Army helicopter gunships. But as we went further and further down into uh, what we used to call Indian country, the helicopters were not available for, for the later part of the day. So uh, we kind of knew we were telegraphing our movements, I guess everybody knew we were coming. And then we didn't have the support. So uh, when we went in there this particular time, we uh, were picking up some troops on a canal bank. and. Um, one of the boats had a um, casualty to the ramp, which uh, the troops walked on to get. So they were having difficulty getting it up, and uh, they had to do it by hand, which was really kind of a laborious and slow process. So in the meantime, while they were doing this, the uh, Viet Cong opened up uh, fire from the opposite bank, which is about uh, 50 meters uh, from the boat. And so all, all hell kind of broke loose. My primary thoughts were, uh, you know, we got to, got to do something to protect those uh, folks on the beach because they, they were kind of sitting ducks. They were, they didn't have the firepower we had. They really couldn't defend themselves as well as we did, as we could. Um, the, the crew of that particular boat was uh, uh, going full bore trying to get the ramp fixed and get the get the troops on board. So um, it was up to the rest of us to try to protect them while uh, until they get their problem solved. Kelly ordered the other boats to form a protective circle around the disabled craft. He then boldly maneuvered his own boat to the exposed side, directly in line with the enemy's fire. A round came in and uh, detonated about six inches from my head and kind of knocked me for a loop. I got uh, knocked down several feet from near the top of the boat down a little chute. But I was holding on to a couple of radio, radio telephone uh, handsets at the time. Transmissions were coming over and I could hear um, one of my men right in the boat there saying he's dead, talking about me and 
I was, I can remember clearly saying, uh, no, I'm not, no, I'm not, you know. My uh, initial reaction when I, when I did get hit, uh, I mean, it was, it was uh, total disbelief, because uh, you, you tend to think that you're really invincible out there, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, I, I got hit, and I, I said, gee, this couldn't, this can't be happening to me. And I, I suppose the adrenaline starts flowing and stuff like that, and you really start doing what you were trained to do. There were about uh, 12 boats all together, each one with a, a boat captain on board, and I was able to uh, relay certain commands to the boats through one of my men who was there. So I was able to uh, keep talking and keep communicating with, uh, with the rest of the boats. During, during this firefight, uh, which was fairly intense, uh, one, one, another boat came alongside and a Navy corpsman uh, jumped on board and came to my assistance. And he's the guy that really stabilized my life, a guy named uh, Richard Nelson, who lives down in Florida. And, uh, you know, under fire, he, he pr um, provided initial first aid to me to keep me going. Without him, I wouldn't have made it. Kelly continued to relay commands until the enemy attack was silenced and the damaged troop carrier was repaired. We, we kind of shot our way out of there a little bit to kind of around the bend of the river. And then uh, a helicopter came in, an army chopper, and um, lifted me off, they call it a dust off pilot, lifted me off and took me to a um, field hospital there and not too far away. March or so of the following year, I heard that uh, I had been put in for the Medal of Honor, and, I, and uh, I, I couldn't believe it, really. And people said, well, don't expect it, because, you know, almost nobody gets it. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, uh, like three or four days before I actually was awarded the Medal of Honor, I was told to be in Washington on such and such a day, and uh, because the, um, uh, the president Wants to wants to meet you or something like that. I guess about 12 or 13 of us um, were, were flown to Washington, and we had a ceremony at the White House on uh, it was um, May 13th, which is my birthday, in 1970. And uh, very nice, very nice, very impressive. The medal was given to me, I believe, um, and I and I wear it as such as a representative of all the men and women who who have fought and who were not in a position to be recognized for, their, for, for what they did. And even though there are only 3,200 or so Medal of Honor, Medals of Honor have been awarded over the last 150 years, uh, when you think of the uh, 20 million or 25 million, 25 million Americans who have served, there are probably thousands and thousands of them who deserve to get what I got. And just because nobody saw it and nobody took the time to uh, document it, uh, they were left out. So I, I kind of wear it thinking of them also and all those who have served. <laughs>